Oh, welcome. Uh, my name is Sumit Gupta. Once again, I'm a veterinarian here in Oahu, Hawaii. And um, I'm a first generation South Asian American veterinarian. I'm the first veterinarian in my family. Uh, I am the second medical practitioner in my family. Uh, my parents moved from India in 1970, 1977. Um, and I wanted to put just a few things that I did growing up. And I think all of these are fundamental in developing who I am and how I present myself because I'll give you some tips on how to leverage yourself and you know write a really good statement for your applications if you do decide to go to veterinary school or even medical school or any other type of professional school and I'd also like to say is that I think it's completely appropriate and acceptable that you decide that you don't want to do those things. And we'll talk about what I did to make sure that I felt that veterinary medicine was the best thing for me. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California and I was really, really into music. I sang opera. Um, I performed competitively throughout the United States, with my high school. Um, and applying to undergrads, uh, living in California, we have an excellent UC system. And so I ended up going to UC San Diego. Uh, there, I eventually landed on becoming pre-veterinary studies, um, but there wasn't necessarily a pre-vet major. And there wasn't necessarily a large culture of going to veterinary school at UC San Diego. We have one veterinary school within the UC system and that's UC Davis and that's in Northern California. Um, and so there weren't really any veterinarians that I knew of growing up. Um, we didn't have pets growing up until I was in college. Um, we didn't have friends that were veterinarians. We didn't have friends that had pets. And so uh, for me, I did biology. Um, I was doing Japanese studies. I did psychology. Um, I in turned at an engineering company. I um, worked in like retail management and I kind of did lots of little things here and there trying to learn kind of like what did I like and where did I fall. Um, but ultimately everything I did throughout high school and college and working jobs here and there I ended up like kind of settling back into like animal medicine. And it was fundamental for me because I grew up uh, going to India um, and seeing the wildlife just interact with humans uh, so closely. And like my grandfather had an elephant on his farm growing up. And um, for me, it was always something like wildlife related or what we would consider exotic animals in the North American hemisphere that could potentially be domestic animals in other parts of the country. Uh, so I ended up majoring in general biology, a double major with psychology, because I was already like three quarters of the way through a psych major. And to do the prerequisites for veterinary school, uh, you were like three classes away from a general bio major. So I was like, you know what, let's just double major. And uh, at my university, we had to do some um, foreign language studies. And so I just, overlap some of the prerequisites with foreign language and to Japanese studies minor. And I just was interested in it. I, I mean, I rarely speak any Japanese now and it really has not come in handy living in Hawaii and I really need to practice. But, um, you know, I, I think it's really important that you focus on what makes you happy, um, what you're interested in. And then, um, you know, for me, it was one extra year. I wasn't I ended up graduating in five years of uh, undergrad. Um, I was working full time as a technician by the time I was ready to graduate. In my for, for fifth year, I was taking like two classes a quarter. Um, and there were those classes that were like one day a week, but three hours or four hours at nighttime. And so um, it was able to work with my schedule and I was able to complete a double major and a minor. Um, and so then uh, I applied to veterinary school, but um, for me, when I applied to veterinary school, I made sure that I tried to leverage 
all the things that made me unique and um, all the experiences that I had done, even though they weren't veterinary medicine related, that led me back to veterinary medicine. So like I was saying, I didn't have a lot of veterinarians or pet parents in my immediate kind of family or relationships uh, growing up. And so I got a job as a veterinary technician in college and I worked for a veterinarian. Um, I found a horse vet very far away, I drove maybe like 50 minutes towards the border um with Mexico to shadow a horse vet we actually like went into Mexico a couple of times to practice medicine which was pretty interesting and then at my university we had one researcher who actually studied uh bonobo chimpanzees and was doing cognitive research so cognitive development research in uh infants uh bonobo infants and that was at the San Diego Zoo and so I was like well I may not be able to get in at the clinic at the zoo, but I might be able to get in through this cognitive research and do some research that way. I at least segue that into like, hey, I am interested in animal science and in veterinary medicine, and I've done all of these other types of jobs, but the things that bring me the most joy and the most passion and the things where I know that I have that calling for is veterinary medicine. And then also I translated that into wildlife medicine and zoo medicine, because growing up, those were the types of animals that I was exposed to and that I found um, the most fascinating and how they interact with humans and that uh, human animal interface in the wild uh, or in, in real life. And it, it translates to small animal because uh, you may learn or may know about one health, which is not only looking at human health and animal health, but public health and ecological health and the intersection of zoonoses like COVID and SARS and um, MERS and all of these other emerging diseases and how they all interact with one another. And so that's sort of like what I kind of focus on in my statement of intent to apply to veterinary schools. Um, but that was all because I had done so many things and I found out what had made me happy. And that's how, how I leveraged going uh, applying to veterinary school. Uh, I ended up going to Ohio State Veterinary uh, College. Um, oh, sorry, the Ohio State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. They would murder me if they actually heard me not say all of those words. And uh, it's a running joke. Ohio State University is called the Ohio State University. Um, and uh, I went there, they are an amazing university. Uh, they are in a metropolitan city, which is perfect for me growing up in the city. And um, they have a wide variety of experts on the clinical staff that write the textbooks. Um, and I really found a welcoming school there, despite the demographics of the university um, being quite skewed. And as a first generation person of color, um, there were three South Asians within the entire four years, um, four year uh, class classes that were there at the time. Um, there were six, seven, eight people of color uh, in my class, my immediate like classmates uh, out of a total of 140. So um, it was a bit of an adjustment coming from Southern California, but I, uh, I, I didn't feel any negativity there. And I know like Ohio State and a lot of the universities are focusing on increasing the diversity of their of, of their class, um, of their cohort. So I think, you know, it is really important when I applied, I talked about my background, um, being LGBT, uh, being somebody who travels internationally and, you know, the things that I can bring from alternative points of view, alternative approaches and alternative beliefs, alternative religious beliefs uh, to veterinary medicine and to broadening the horizons that uh, the other students and the, the professors and the clinicians could see and interact with to help develop the entire uh, kind of school. Uh, so things I did at Ohio State um, during my tenure there, four years of, of veterinary school, I did summer research programs. So one year I did a research study on vitamin D, serum vitamin D levels in captive Asian elephants in North America. And then I uh, compared those to serum vitamin D levels to South Asian elephants uh, 
domesticated, however you want to take that, domesticated uh, Asian elephants in Thailand. Uh, one of my teachers was from Thailand. She taught at Ohio State University. She ran a research lab that I worked in on vitamin D and um, turmeric um, on cancer. And then she connected me with a researcher in Thailand who was here uh, doing an exchange program. And he connected me with his classmates that ran zoos in Thailand. And so I ended up going to Thailand and working uh, in a zoo for three weeks. Uh, then I did a program where I studied Asian elephant medicine at the University of Chiang Mai at their veterinary school. And so um, I was leveraging my connections and networking and kind of pursuing the things that made me interested. But that's some of the stuff I did at Ohio State. I also went to Spain with another professor and did a spay and neuter program um, at one of the shelters out there. Um, I also did a ton of zoo externships and preceptorships, which really require you to plan ahead, um, really apply early on and get those letters of recommendations. And so what I did is when I did those international programs, I had made sure that I spent a lot of time discussing learning, um, getting key tips and kind of um, pearls of wisdom is what a old professor used to say is like, what are those key pearls of wisdom that you wish you knew, or you wish somebody had told you, like that you can tell me that will make it make me a better doctor. Uh, and so leveraging all of those so I can get those uh, letters of recommendation that they know that I'm curious, learning, retaining information, and always pushing myself to understand a little bit deeper. Um, so I did externships uh, during vet school at San Diego Zoo. Um, I did them at Smithsonian Zoo, Mystic Aquarium, uh, um, Oregon Zoo, Air, uh, Phoenix Zoo. Um, and so I really kind of pursued my passions and what made me really happy, which was zoo and wildlife. Leveraging technology, we live in this technological age with AI. I don't know how that impacts you guys writing your papers. You know, the news makes things sound really crazy, but you know, uh, through my externships, I met so many other veterinarians and residents and interns, and they all exchanged PDFs of veterinary textbooks with me. And so I had purchased an iPad, I put them all on there. And so even doing clinical rotations, I was able to search a PDF textbook, look up a disease, act quickly, give appropriate discharge instructions. And so all of these things are at your fingertips. You're all probably better at it than me, um, but making sure that you can take advantage of everything that's at your fingertips in order to speed up your process, speed up your retention, access more information, empower the clients, empower the patients to get better um, and improve your job satisfaction and improve like how you feel about how you're doing uh, with your whole life in general. Um, and then comparative studies. So. Um, there's a lot that we know about veterinary medicine and there's a lot that we don't know about veterinary medicine, but as much as we know, um, and we know about ourselves and our experiences, we have to share those and uh, communicate those to the pet parents or to the people involved in animal care, because the more that they can understand and empathize um, with the care of their pet, the more that they're going to respond uh, and take ownership and perform, right? So being able to know why they're giving insulin or know why their pet isn't feeling good or eating and why the treatment's important and why not to wait, et cetera. Um, my career path after graduating vet school, um, this is like a really broad overview, but I did do a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery. I intended to do zoo residencies, but my life had just ended up taking me in a different path and I had to follow kind of what my passions were, but also where uh, the opportunity was presenting itself. And so there are residencies where you can specialize in certain um, professions like internal medicine, surgery, ophthalmology, oncology, dermatology. Um, it, the list goes on, but I ended up doing emergency medicine overnight at a high volume, low cost overnight uh, emergency room in Los Angeles. 
And I ended up managing that hospital for several years. Um, I was one of the only overnight hospitals that saw exotic animals on emergency. And so um, I did pets and then I also did wildlife for the city of Los Angeles and Pasadena's humane societies um, and animal controls. They would bring me their emergency cases and their exotic animals as well. Um, I did end up going from emergency overnights into general practice where I do primarily small animal. I did do exotics on the side. Um, it tends not to be a high volume. And so I do it to keep my passions alive and happy and uh, to stimulate my brain because it's certainly um, not always easy uh, to know what's going on or to achieve a diagnosis. But I'm able to help those pets and help those families provide the care for the pets that they would like. Um, eventually, my life took me into industry. And so that's the portion that I've been aligned with for VIP, but um, industry is outside of, uh, outside of pra clinical practice, it's outside of research, and it's kind of about the uh, companies and the organizations that support veterinarians or clinical practitioners. And so I work for IDEX, which you probably are all very familiar with. Um, I'm told it is the largest employer in Maine. Um, IDEX Diagnostic Laboratories is the world's largest veterinary laboratory. It's the world's largest diagnostic laboratory, but only does water testing and animal testing. They don't do human testing. They operate in 80 countries. They have over 8,000, they probably have more than 8,000 employees now. Um, and they are innovators and leaders in diagnostics, including patient side testing, reference laboratory testing, radiology, so x-rays, um, x-ray imaging. Um, they are the world's largest water testing company. Um, although it is only a small percentage of their general business, they have water testing kits all over the world. If you look up water quality reports in Maine, you'll probably see the IDEX logo. I see them in San Diego water quality reports. Um, they have diagnostic testing kits up in uh, space. And so um, IDEX Laboratories employs a wide variety of individuals, including veterinarians, to do research and development on diagnostic tests that lead the way in veterinary medicine. But they also employ veterinarians in the field. So I was aligned with New York City, Connecticut, and Long Island. Um, I had a thousand clinics that I served, and my job was to help veterinarians in clinical practice diagnose, treat, and use. Uh, and follow up with additional diagnostic testing uh, using IDEX diagnostics. And so um, I did do public speaking, continuing education serv uh, services. I also would come in and kind of consult and evaluate like this is your workflow in your clinic. These are the types of issues that you're seeing or types of medical conditions um, or patients that you have. Uh, these are the types of tests that you want to run. This is how you can optimize your workflow because I had practice management experience. I had exotic experience. And so I was able to relay what I know from clinical practice and how that goes from a technician to a medical practitioner to a manager, and then alleviate kind of some of the the hurdles or the, what we call bottlenecking within their clinic so that we can speed up their process and make them more efficient. Um, I did that for about two years, and I'll tell you is that it, for me, as somebody who likes to talk a lot, as you can tell, um, it was something that I really loved and found that I thrived in, but living in New York City was not my place. And so ultimately, I decided to move to Hawaii, where I had interviewed for a job years ago. And now I work in general practice here in Hawaii, um, in Honolulu. Um, I do small animal medicine. I do emergency during the daytime. Um, I do fish medicine on the side for the hotels. And I have just started volunteering at the Honolulu Zoo just to help out on one of my days off, like just something for fun. Um, I do speak at public conference or national conventions for veterinarians. And then I speak at little uh, organizations uh, throughout the country and not to say little or big, but not as big as like VMX, which is the world's largest veterinary conference in Florida. Um, but I speak for um, a variety of organizations and I talk about diversity um, coming from a diverse background who has very little experience in veterinary medicine growing up to have uh, parents who don't necessarily understand the uh, types of things and the and the depth of knowledge and care that we can provide for pets 
and still don't necessarily understand, you know, um, a lot of different things about veterinary medicine and how advanced that it is. Uh, I talk about authentic communication with pet parents of diverse backgrounds. Um, and I sort of approach every day and every patient and their family as if I was trying to educate my parents as to why their pet has X, Y, and Z uh, diabetes and how to educate them in line with what they already know or what they've experienced maybe with their own lives or with other pets or um, build on what their current beliefs are about the value of pets in their households and educating people across uh, the country and how to speak with clients. Um, it's really fascinating about, uh, and I didn't put up any statistics here because it's not necessarily super important, but 85 to 90% of veterinarians in the United States are um, of a European descent. Um, maybe about 11% of them are considered uh, European Hispanic, but uh, about six, four, six percent are Asian American, 2% are African American or of African descent. Um, and there's very, very few indigenous, native Hawaiian, native Alaskan veterinarians, but we know that the United States demographic is not necessarily 90% European descent. Uh, well, it's not. And depending on the communities that you may be from or working with, uh, those might be even more different than uh, the veterinarian population. So as a profession that thought that's not necessarily uh, super diverse, how do we communicate with clients uh, who are? And how do we expect them to hold the same values and up, uh, have the same goals as a veterinarian when we are theoretically the pinnacle or that hold pets at the highest regard in their care to the highest standard? Um, and so that's sort of where I come from with my uh, background uh, throughout my entire life and industry experience. And that's sort of where I found um, my passion in educating veterinarians um, and veterinary staff on how we can improve uh, the VCPR, which is a veterinary client patient relationship, um, improve patient outcomes, improve client, uh, improve client or pet parent experiences and improve veterinarian job satisfaction. Um, because certainly it is strife with a lot of depression, um, self-doubt and concern because we live in a, uh, in a, we work in a profession that is something we're extremely passionate about. And um, there are cases that we don't succeed in, in helping patients and that can take a toll emotionally. Um, and so that's sort of what I do now on uh, outside of clinical practice. Um, so I wanted to leave with some um, tips. Uh, how do you get there? Authenticity, a variety of experiences and networking and mentorship. So you should always do what makes you happy. You should uh, be curious and follow your curiosities. And you should leverage the unique skills that you bring to the table. Um, you bring a unique background, you bring unique experiences, you may bring unique languages, uh, you may bring um, unique perspectives or points of views that 90% uh, of your colleagues may believe in one way or think one way is the right way, but you may bring a unique perspective which may change the whole face of the profession um, and how you approach the care of patients. And it may be, a more effective way or more efficient way or work better for certain patients or demographics of pet parents. Um, getting a variety of experiences. So there's so many options out there in veterinary medicine and outside of veterinary medicine. So I did cognitive research in animals. And so I realized like, oh, I definitely don't wanna do this. I just don't wanna sit in a chair and watch animals all day. I wanna work with them, be hands-on. Um, make sure that this is really what you wanna do. Veterinary medicine is not easy. It is not easy to get into. It's not easy to stay in. And it's not easy after graduating. And if you go into clinical practice, um, it's not easy. There are days you get bit, you get scratched, you get pooped on, you get peed on, you get yelled at, you have patients that don't survive. Um, 
And so you need to make sure that this is what you really, really want to do and that there's not something else out there that you could do um, and be happy with um, because it's a long, hard journey and it's super rewarding, but it's not going to be easy. Um, I always recommend carry all those lessons you learned across all professions, all jobs, all experiences, all backgrounds, all walks of life. You bring so much to the table and you can utilize that in every step of your life, regardless of it's in veterinary medicine or not. And you need to step out of your comfort zone. So yes, I say be your curious self and follow what makes you happy and do those things. But you need to look at things outside of that and outside of small animal or outside of equine medicine or outside of large animal medicine. You know, you guys live very in proximity close to IDEX. There's a lot of research jobs. There's a lot of internships. And that is another facet of veterinary medicine or um, biomedical research. Uh, that you could look into and see, oh, do you, or maybe you're really fascinated by developing diagnostic tests that are going to change the lives of many pets around the world. Um, networking mentorship. I joke, I have one mentee um, and I sort of became her mentor because she never left me alone. But that persistence really impressed me. And I was like, you know what? Yes, I will write your letter of recommendation. Yes, I will connect you with my friends throughout the country who do the things that you're interested in doing. And now she's done a couple of internships. She's landed an uh, externship. She's landed an internship at one of, the, uh, one of the universities that she really wanted to go to. Um, and that's because she sort of made me be her, men her mentor. But stay in contact with the individuals that you value. Um, a few tips on how to engage with a mentor or get feedback is you should always ask for feedback before you do something like, hey, I'm going to go restrain this horse. Can you let me know if there any way that I can restrain them better? Where should my hands be um, when I'm giving a public presentation? Can you let me know how many times I say, um, can you let me know if there's any analogies that I can improve upon? If you give them specific parameters to assess you on and give you feedback on, you're gonna get better feedback rather than, yeah, you went out there and did something and say, oh, like, how did I do? You did good. So you wanna get specific feedback. You have to give specific guidelines for what that feedback would be. Um, ask your mentors, uh, what is their preferred method of contact? Um, don't text me if I don't text back. Don't email me if I'm not an emailer. Don't leave me voice messages if I don't check my voicemail. So you can always ask them, hey, what is the best way to stay in contact with you? Um, you know, I'd like to just update you on my journey throughout veterinary medicine. And they'll let you know. And sometimes that's LinkedIn, which you all should develop a LinkedIn. Um, it is one, the easiest way to go back and remember what you did, where you did it. Uh, for when you do your resumes in the future, because I'll tell you at 37, I cannot remember what year those things were, what I did when. And so it's a great way to just kind of keep a running tally. And then when you are applying for jobs, uh, you can go back and see what you did, where you did it, when you did it. And then you can kind of tailor that for each individual job or application that you're doing. Um, and I'll tell you, as my mom always told me, keep a journal in, in high school, write down all of your experiences, all of your volunteer things. And I never did. And then I had to apply to college and I was like, damn, I don't know when I did that, where I did it, what it was specifically for, how many times I did it. Um, and I still don't do it, but I'm sort of at a different point in my career now where um, my background and a lot of the larger things I've done speak for themselves rather than um, all the little nitty things that I have to say, yes, I did work at a hospital. Yes, I did work with uh, horses. Yes, I did volunteer at the zoo. Yes, I did do like, uh, outreach for students at the shelter and something like that. You know, you want to have very specifics and I'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, actually, the next slide, I think. Um, so when you write your applications, please do not say you've always wanted to be a veterinarian. Everyone says that. Um, be specific. Uh, so they ask you like your jobs and your work history and your volunteer hours. And you want to give specific examples of procedures medications, diseases that you've worked with, surgeries that you've helped with. Uh, don't say I've restrained animals, filled medications, and like did TPRs. Probably everybody's done that. 
What they want to know is how engaged were you in the process and what did you learn? What did you take away? What types of things did you see? And the more specific you can be, the more medical terminology you can use, the better because they know that you are engaged. Action verbs, I'll put that on the next slide, but every word you use should be hand selected, carefully tailored, and or convey a feeling of more than just one single word on a piece of paper. So uh, you have a limited number of words that you can put in each box when you're applying to veterinary school. Every word you use should be hand selected so that it conveys a feeling and or emotion more than just that one single word on the piece of paper. Um, and that is how you write an application. Uh, and that is how you write a cover letter in the future. And that is how you um, optimize your word counts as well. Hopefully it's not letter counts because then you can get screwed because some words are really long, but word counts, um, you should always spell out veterinarian. Don't just put vet on those pieces of paper uh, or on those applications. When you're writing a cover letter, why medicine and why not other types of animal interaction? Like, why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to do medical care? Uh, if pull on personal experiences that you had in your life that made you bond with an animal or a pet, who inspired you? Where do you see yourself after graduation? And how do you plan on getting there? Why is veterinary medical college or veterinary school important to your career path? And when did you know that it was veterinary medicine and not another career? These are some basic things, right? And then you have to take all of that information and then you have to step back and say, okay, this is why I want to be a veterinarian. And, you know, I just helped another student and I was like, you know, you went through a traumatic experience and diagnosing your dog with cancer and no one could diagnose your dog. And, you know, you were so frustrated going through that process. And what you have decided is that you don't want to watch other people go through that. If you can be the person to help guide these families through the care, uh, through medical care for cancer and their family members and their pets, that is why you're driven to be a veterinarian and go to you know, be an oncologist. So, you know, you have to kind of step back and say like, what, look at that overall picture after you've answered those questions. Um, since this is recorded, um, I actually don't have the rights to these. I don't know, somebody gave these to me years ago, um, but these are action verbs. So these are words that convey a feeling or message more than just a single word on the people piece of paper. And so these are action verbs that were advised to me to utilize during um, cover letter writing, resume writing, things like that. Um, these are a little bit more specific to veterinary medicine, but obviously can be applied to lots of jobs out there. But um, I restrained an animal. That's not conveying a lot, right? But if you uh, assisted or demonstrated, um, facilitated examination, um, you know, through restraint, these are words that have um, more feeling um, and convey a greater uh, interaction and kind of ownership over the actions than just kind of colloquial terms. Um, so you have this on recording, so you could probably refer back to this. I'm gonna end this presentation with a thank you. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, for asking me or uh, pulling me in here. Um, my email is sumi at omvet.com. You can check out omvet.com. It is still in its development, but if you did need any help or consultation services, you can let me know. You know, uh, when we apply to vet school, like, you know, these are kinds of things that we're going to be talking about. But um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me through these uh, contact methods. Uh, my, my dog is here. Uh, that's Obi-Wan Kenobi here in Hawaii. Um, it's just around the corner from my house, but um, do what makes you happy, be where you want to be happy, and um, make sure that you get those life experiences that make sure you know that veterinary medicine is the right one for you because it can be extremely rewarding. Um, but there's so many career options out there that you know sometimes we grow up thinking it's we want to do one thing and uh, I wanted to grow up being a zoo vet and work in the wildlife and um, work with elephants and now um, it's taken me a long time but I'm kind of circling back and now I'm going to start volunteering at the zoo and doing fish medicine and I think that that's sort of 
eventually where I ended up, but I definitely took a large roundabout way to get there and I still do a lot more things on the side. So I um, hope you guys uh, found this really helpful and um, best of luck, take care and um, yeah, you guys are going to do great.